Um, I'm Colin Jones. I'm going to talk today about solid closure. Uh, who's, who's heard of the solid principles before? And who, who basically has a, a good understanding of what they are? Who's, okay. Great. Awesome. So it'll be new information for a lot of people. And for those of you who know, hopefully you learned something new as well. OK. So first, uh, like I said, it sounds like people are pretty much unfamiliar with solid. Um, but I am curious about what paradigm's home for you. So hands, who's, who's mostly object-oriented as like a home-based home paradigm? Daily work sort of thing. OK, great. And functional? Cool. Very cool. Good mix. Logic? Nice. Stack-based, concatenative? No, nobody. Probably not. All right. And which one's closure again? OK, so maybe, maybe there's a mix of all, all of these guys that we can take a look at. So uh, this is a tweet I saw the other day. Uh, closure is one of the most object-oriented languages you can find today by takeout weight. See here? Um, Pretty, pretty thought-provoking tweet, I thought. And uh, there's been a lot of controversy lately on some various mailing lists and stuff about what object-oriented programming means exactly. Uh, the reason I bring it up is because uh, Clojure has got some aspects of object-oriented programming that are really interesting, I think. And the solid principles are actually from object-oriented programming. And I think from these different paradigms, I think we're all actually after the same thing. I think we all want things to be easy. We want programming to be easy. We want our daily work to be easy. We want things to be easy to change, things to be easy to add on to. Who wants their job to be hard? Right? <laughs> OK, right. So this idea of simple versus easy, this is, this is, these are definitely interesting ideas to think about and talk about. Uh, who saw Ridge's Simple Made Easy talk, right? So yeah, awesome talk. If you haven't seen it, you definitely need to. Uh, but it's t one of the things that really spoke to me about it was about not the things that were different about simple simplicity and ease, but the things that were the same, right? You build simple systems so that your job can be easy, right? So that in the long term, things will be easy. Things that are easy are not necessarily simple. Things that are simple long term generally are going to tend to be easy. And the solid principles I like to think of as a good way to, to think about simplicity in the concrete, right? Think about how to, how to structure our programs. Right, and, and principles, if, if you look it up in the dictionary, it's something along the lines of you know, uh, ideas that form a basis for our thinking. Um, but I want to take a different approach today and think about what causes these principles to come into being. Right? These are not like physical properties of the world that, that govern um, all of life right, or all of programming. These are, these are ideas that came out in response to specific problems people are trying to solve with their programs, things that were hard and, uh, in changing your program, making your program um, uh, expand and grow over time, large programs. Um, so I want to talk about principles um, as responses to problems, and in particular the solid principles. Now, since closure is a, a different thing than object-oriented programming, we're, we're kind of like rejecting the idea of, of mutable state in general. There are times you know, when we need it, and there's these great constructs for that. But uh, th th there's so many things that are different in closure than OO that um, I'd like to talk about the Dylos principles instead of the solid principles, right? This is obviously a totally different thing, right? You can see there's, um, oh, it's just backwards, OK. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, who knows what a Dylo is, right? So it's the plural of Dylos, right? This is why this, we're using this acronym. And the Dylo, of course, is the Dilophosaurus. Anybody getting closer to know what the Dilophosaurus is? Right, remember J Jurassic Park, right, this guy? Right, my hope is that by the end of this, you're going to be totally stoked like this dude. and um, you're going to say, OK, yeah, the dialogue principles, those are way better than solid principles, right? OK, that's, that was kind of a long, expanded joke, and we're not going to do any more of those. So let's, let's get down into it. So these are the five principles we're going to talk about. We're just kind of, kind of uh, see what problems that they're trying to solve, see what the applications of them are in closure, how things are the same as OO, how things are different than OO. So first, dependency inversion, right? Um, the problem here that we're trying to solve with the dependency inversion principle is uh, when we've got a change to our code in one place, and that change is going to cascade to too many other places in your code. Right? Who's seen this problem? And you're kind of compelled to agree with me that this is a problem because it said too many, right? Like, by definition, that's a problem, right? Too many. OK, kind of cheap. But so the, I, I, I've seen this problem all over the place um, in all kinds of different paradigms. Um, You've got rigidity, you've got fragility. Things are difficult to change because they cause you to make changes all over your system. One cause uh, of this, and the one that this dependency inversion is specifically designed to, to help mitigate, 
is um, when you have higher level modules depending on lower level details. Okay, so what does this mean? So, so higher level modules are forced to reuse the low, lower level, right? That means clients to the higher level also have to uh, reuse the lower level. So, right, so we're starting to see that whatever assumptions we make in a particular module or function or whatever, um, clients of that are forced to, to build on top of and also reuse your same assumptions. Right? And sometimes that's okay, but I'm gonna give you a concrete case um, in which it, it, it probably isn't. Right. So, uh, who's familiar with NREPL? Really cool tool. Um, basically, a, a networked REPL tool where you, that allows you to like serve up um, an, uh, an interface um, so other people can hook in and execute code on your your running you know closure process. This is Chaz Emrix. This is not Chaz's code. I made this up. Um, it's similar, but this is this is what would have happened if if Chaz had, had done a naive approach, right? He's using B encode here, B E B encode, and he's, he's uh, He's reading some bytes from a socket, uh, changing into string um, on the receive side, right? We've got send and receive are our two kind of main things that are going on, right? We send to a socket, we receive from a socket. And then here at the bottom, we've got sort of like an, like an echo, echo server, right? You send something to the socket, and then you just, you just print the same thing back uh, to the socket. So what assumptions do we have here, right? We've got dependencies um, on B encode itself, right? The encoding mechanism. Um, this payload to string and reading the bytes. And we've also got a dependency on a socket, right? Socket communication. Right, so when is this a problem? Um, it's, it, it's a problem in, in NREPL's case because uh, Chaz wants to be able to, to do things like, you know, talk to Heroku, right? So he wants an HTTP server, right? We're not gonna be able to talk to Heroku over a socket, right? We're gonna have to go over HTTP um, and so that means that this echo server can't be reused, right? Does that make sense? So we're using this receive directly, this send directly. Pretty simple example, but we're gonna have to rewrite this echo function um, if we want it to use a, a different, a different uh, transport mechanism, a different encoding mechanism. So one way to swap out these low-level details is in Java land, we, we could use something like aspect-oriented programming dependency injection, right? These, these would be, who's used those, right? Fun stuff, right? Closure, we could use dynamic binding, right? Uh, we, could, we, could, we could rebind um, the, the socket communication, rebind um, those send and receive functions. Um, is, is this a good idea? Who's, who's felt the pain of dynamic binding all over the place and you, you're not really sure what's going on, right? I've, I've definitely written code that um, became problematic to reason about. So I think we can do better. And OO s says, in, with the uh, dependency inversion principle, that we should be depending on abstractions and not concretions. The effect of that in OO is, is uh, an abstraction is like an interface, an abstract class. The concretion would be a, you know, a concrete class. In closure of the language, we see, we see a good example of that in um, you know, iSeq, IDREF, iPersistent Vector. There's interfaces all over the place. Rich has done a great job of, of creating these abstractions so that if we want to go ahead and replace um, some, uh, some, some core piece of functionality, like if we want to make our own version of an atom, we can just implement iAtom and it'll, it'll pretty much work, right? And then we can uh, pass that thing in what, what, whatever we've implemented into um, some function that knows how to talk to an IAT. Closure's also got Java interop um, capabilities in, in, in the language itself, not in the implementation, but in the use of the language. Um, and so we can talk about interfaces and abstract classes, right? So we can use in Clojure def interface and gen class. Right, def interface, gen class. So that's it, right? That's the only interesting thing, right? No, those things suck. Who's, who, who uses this and likes it? Who uses it? Who uses def interface and gen class and really, really likes to live in that world and do most of your programming in Clojure with def interface and gen class? It's, it's painful, right? It's, it's tremendously painful to work with these things. And it, it, it's awesome when you need it because it's just what you need. You need to interact with Java. Maybe you need some, some actual class files. You need some AOT stuff. But it's, it's painful, right? It's not... It, 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 it's not the most fun thing to work with. So, just kidding about next principle, right? Clojure's got better Java stuff than Java, better abstractions, right? We've got def protocol as our abstraction. We've got def record and def type, right? And the really cool thing that's different about Clojure here, right, is, is, is that our concretions, def record, def type, we can't define functions on these things without making the abstraction, right? 
Like in Java, we can just make a concrete class, give it some methods, and now we've got a concretion that we're forced to depend on, right? This isn't specifically related to the example we'll see, but we'll see, we'll see the specific um, implementation of it in a bit. And you can imagine that uh, in, in Clojure, you're going to have to write a protocol in order to, to have functions, right? Def multi and def method, you can think of def multi as the abstraction, def method as the concretion, of course. So back in the naive version, uh, that's what it looks like. And this is what uh, NREPR really looks like. Chaz has defined uh, an abstraction called the transport. And he's got you know, some, some nice documentation here, and he's got two basic methods, receive and send. Right? And anybody who's interested in defining a transport can go ahead and implement that uh, protocol or extend a type to it. And then we can use the abstraction. Here's the implementation, one of them. An FN transport that he's got defined internally. Right, and in our send here, we're, we're, we're going to take a message that, we, that comes in, we're going to stringify the keys, and we're going to uh, call this send function on the re results of that. Um, the receive, uh, by default, we're going to use a pretty much infinite timeout. Um, we're going to translate the keys uh, to keywords, and we're going to call the receive function with, with the timeout. Um, we're also implementing the closable abstraction. What is an abstraction really, though? So in OO, we talked about like interfaces. Pro protocols are like sort of the obvious sort of Java E um, abstraction sort of things. But th it's so much the same as Java that it's almost like there'd be no reason to give a talk about it if, if, if we were just going to talk about protocols the whole time, right? So I've got, um, this is a very famous author, Jonathan Wikipedia. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of him. Uh, but so. Uh, Abstraction is factoring out details, right? We, we don't want to think about all the details of the thing that we're, we're doing um, when we do it. So let's point out some of the abstractions here. Just yell them out. Where are the abstractions in this code? Transport. Transport. Transport's one. It's a protocol, right? Closable, right? Inter Java interface, closable. And I'm going to assert here that receive fun and send fun and close, those are all abstractions too. These are functions that are being passed into this guy, and then we're going to call those functions without knowing the internal details of how those guys are implemented, right? And so what's interesting here is that we've got both an implementation of an abstraction in FN transport and a consumer of an abstraction um, where those abstractions are, are the functions that are being passed in, right? And, and so the implication here is that a higher order function is a consumer of an abstraction that is a function, right? And to me, that, that was kind of like a, a really interesting thought um, that we talk in Clojure about, you know, higher order functions are great because they allow you to make your programs more modular, right? You can factor out the details. And this is kind of a, exactly the same sort of abstraction that we're talking about in OO. Right? We want to remove the details from, uh, of execution um, from, from their implementation in a particular function. Right? And, and, and sort of one of the proofs of this is that ifun is actually literally an interface in Java, right? So you just, it's an interface that has the invoke method right, defined on it. Um, and when you call defin, that, that uh, interface is going to be implemented. Right? So it's, that, that's kind of the easy way to think about it. But you can also think about um, what details we need to call a function. Right? We don't need too many. What do we need? Like we need to know maybe, maybe how many arguments it takes, maybe uh, the types of those arguments if we're doing particular things inside. I mean, obviously, there are going to be other assumptions that go on that we need to think about um, when, we, when we're calling a function. Um, I mean, it, it kind of depends on what the assumptions are in the place it's being used. Uh, but in order to just call it, like, from a syntactic perspective, you just wrap parentheses around it, right? Maybe, maybe you need some arguments. Right, and this is, this is the idea we're talking about. Had we not injected these functions as arguments here, had we just called, you know, define send fun in place here and just called it right away, right, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't really be consuming that abstraction, right? We'd be just calling, just calling some concrete thing directly here. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons I think higher order functions um, are interesting, is that, that, that we don't actually have to create the details ourselves. And this is the same sort of idea in OO. You don't want to, um, there's no point in making an abstraction if you're not going to, you know, inject that abstraction in some way, you know, from somewhere else, from the calling code. Namespaces can also be thought of as abstractions, so I, I, I don't know of a lot of code that actually uses them in that way, right? You could, 
you can think about like passing a namespace, the name of the namespace into somebody, and somebody knows that that namespace defines you know, some specifically named functions, and you could use like um, some of the namespace lookup mechanisms to find those things. Um, but in a way, they also give you buckets of code, places, places to move your code, um, and, and sort of abstract away th things like the private functions of a namespace. You don't, you don't really want to think about those internal details, right? You know about some, some small number of public things. Um, but most people don't write namespaces in a way that, that one is substitutable for another, right? You could if you wanted to. Okay, so interface segregation. Um, here's, here's another problem. What happens when your abstraction becomes too fat? Right? Anybody ever worked with an abstraction that was too fat? I do every day. I, I, I do Rails code. Um, right? there's, there's this thing called active record. Right? So what if, what if in Clojure there was an active record abstraction, um, which I would implement with, with, with a user, right? and I needed to define you know, all these methods on it? Right? Let's, let's pretend there are 400 more methods right here, right? with et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Well, that's fine. Right? Active record gives you a lot of power. Um, it, it can get a little unwieldy when your code gets too big and you're putting all your domain mod or you're actually yeah domain modeling in here. Um, but there's a lot of ideas here. And what if I what if I don't actually want them all, right? What if I just want to find and save things and maybe validate, right? I can split that active record up into into, into more cohesive protocols, right? I can say, oh, I, I want something that's storable. I want something that's you know validatable. And I'm, I'm using sort of Java interfacey words so that I I have OO cred here. But uh, you, you can name it whatever you want. Right? But the idea here is, is that the abstractions are easier to think about uh, for me and I think for most people um, if they're smaller, right? If you've got you know, 400 methods on your protocol, that's, that's, that's too many, right? I think, I think that's probably you know, pretty much common sense and I, I think probably pretty uncontroversial. And the idea with interface segregation principle is that clients shouldn't have to depend on parts of the abstractions that they're not going to use, right? So, you know, reasonably small cohesive protocols. Um, and namespaces. I mean, th there's some exceptions, right? Closure Core is, is a huge namespace. Um, there's some some reasons, you know, behind the. Uh, there's some there's some good reasons for it, right? It is the core of the language. Um, it's it's sort of special in that way. Um, maybe there'd be a way to break it up somehow, but I, you know, personally, I, I really like the convenience of just just knowing that the stuff's there. Um, but I think it, I, I I think in 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 my projects, I, I I try and make you know small small namespaces, small protocols. I think, I think it tends to make things easier to reason about and to keep the whole abstraction in your head at one time. Right, this is pretty common practice. I, I, I don't see a lot of code uh, that, that does, does the opposite of that thing. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. Um, Liskov substitution. What if we have a subtype that's not substitutable for its base type? Right, the common example in OO um, is, uh, is, is sh shows that a, a reasonable reading of an abstraction is, is going to be incorrect, right? If, if the subtype is not substitutable for, substitutable for the base type, then that means um, when you're using the abstraction, things don't work, work as you expect. Right, so in OO, you can think of this as Ruby code. We've got a rectangle that's got a getter and setter and height and width. And we got a square that inherits from that rectangle, right? Um, and we've got setters that are, are going to show that the width, um, when we set the width, we're actually going to set the height too, so that, so that it stays a square. Ditto for the height, right? Seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do, right? We've got getters and setters. And let's just assume that we have an area function that's defined you know, in, in the, the normal way to, to figure out what the area is of, of the rectangle. So let's say we got this rectangle. We set the width to 10, we set the height to 5. What should the area be? The consumer of this abstraction says the area should be 50, right? Are they right? Yeah, it depends. Depends on what they have, right? They're not right if they have a square. They're right if they have you know, the normal rectangle, right? So it's interesting, right? We've made this decision here when we're setting the height for a square that we want to you know, make sure the height and width are always the same. We made this decision that an, the area of a rectangle means that we just multiply the width by the height. And the consumer here says that the height and width, you know, when you set them, they should, they should, the area should work out to the right thing. 
Right? So those are all pretty reasonable decisions, but we've obviously ended up with, with you know, the, wrong, the wrong result. Right? In the case of a square, we're, we're going to get um, 5 times 2 is 25, or 5 times 5 is 25. So it's kind of a weird example, right? Because we've provided getters and setters. We've got mutable state here. So is this even possible outside Java interop enclosure, right? It, and outside of mutable state in general? Well, I think it is. Um, even though concrete inheritance is not in the language, right? Um, we can still make those assumptions of, about what area means. And uh, in particular, you can think of a rectangle as uh, being defined you know, with these uh, these protocol functions, and you can think of the square as, as being defined here, you know, making new versions of things, right? We're not actually mutating anything, but the, the, the idea here is when you change the height here, um, you, you may be doing a graphics transform or something like that, you know, changing the size of the thing, um, and you actually want to think about, you know, making, taking one thing and getting a new version of the, that thing back. And we can, we can come across exactly the same problem. So obviously, this is a really, really stupid example, right? Squares, rectangles. Maybe, maybe the idea is, is to just uh, throw that example out. Um, and that's fine. I'm fine with throwing the example away and saying that, that, that it's too simple. But I'm not fine with saying that I've never encountered this problem, where somebody makes a, an implementation of my abstraction, and they have different assumptions than I made when I created the abstraction. Right? Assumptions are, are where problems live, right? Where problems go to, to hide until, until you're in production. Right? So let's, let's think about this a little deeper. This is, this is Barbara Liskov's definition of the subtype. Go ahead and read it. I'll give you like six seconds to read this right, and internalize it completely. Don't go back and read. Just kidding. Right? This is, this is pretty, pretty deep stuff. But the, the idea here um, is that it's defining what a subtype means. Right? A subtype is specifically this thing where the behavior of the, the thing using it um, is unchanged when the subtype is, when the, the thing at the bottom is substituted for the thing at the top, right? So let's, let's change our problem statement from the subtype is not substitutable for its base type to be, a, say, a particular concretion is not substitutable for, substitutable for the abstraction. Because by definition, a subtype is, uh, is substitutable for its base type, right? So in, in, in fact, in our, in our stupid example, a square is not actually a subtype of a rectangle, right? Because it's by definition not. In the language, we, you know, we munched it, munched the concepts together. Say subclasses are the same as subtypes, but it's not really true. So if we think about abstractions and closure, we can think about um, the concretions being, you know, again the protocol interface implementers, reify, proxy, def record, def type. We can think about defn and def method being implementation details, concretions. But Liskov substitution, in general, is, is about expectations. And in order to solve this sort of expectation problem, it's, it's not really, really a trivial task, right? Like, how, how, how can I, myself, tell you what to expect without you know, giving me all, the, all my experience, right? I can't even tell my, my future self what to expect, right? Um, I mean, I can. There, there are certain ways we can think about doing it. Um, but it, it's not an easy problem in general, right? Um, and this is one of the reasons I like I like testing. Um, I like um, I like the idea of pre and post conditions. I haven't actually used it much. I like the idea of contracts programming, um, generative tests, documentation. These are all great tools to help you codify like exactly what you were thinking when you wrote this thing, what assumptions you've made, what your expectations of implementers are. But um, yeah, I think the Liskov substitution principle is sort of an interesting one in that it's it's almost more of a human problem than a technology problem, right? Like expectations are, are the interesting thing. So what if we have uh, a, a, a new feature that we want to add to a system? Um, and we have to go back and change existing code in order to add this new feature, right? I do this like every day, right? I, Code's going to change, right? I'm not, just, not everything's a plugin, right? I'm not just going to write a new Eclipse thing and throw it in OSGI and have my system keep working. Um, that that tool is great, I mean, but it, it's not always going to work in practice. Um, but if it did, that would be awesome, right? Like we, we make this new feature and you know we write some new code and throw it in there, 
That would be really cool. Um, but specifically, what if we want to make changes um, to an existing system, and the thing that we would really like to change is out, actually outside of our system, of our control? What if we don't own it? What if, uh, you know, it's, what if we do own it, but it's actually really thick and hard to change, right? So the open close principle says we can get around this by, by making things open for extension. The idea is extending, you know, adding to it, um, but not you know, touching the existing source code. And close for modification, that would be touching the existing source code. It would be cool if our systems all worked that way and we could just you know, plug and play, have things work. So some of the traditional OO you know, directions we go, we just, obviously we want to avoid switching on type. We're checking the instance of this, instance of this. It can get kind of nasty if we want to add uh, the ability to, to check for a new thing. We'll see a concrete example in a minute. Um, then we're going to have to go back and change our existing code. Um, and, and if we have code that's external to us, we can use wrappers to actually you know, change the way we interact with those. And this is kind of yucky. I mean, you guys have seen these talks and these articles about the expression problem, right? And, and, and so closures, protocols, extension stuff is awesome, an awesome tool for wiring you know, an existing protocol up to you know, an existing uh, class or uh, type that you don't own either of. You can just you know, wire them up together and your code will just sort of work. It's, it's great stuff. Um, if you haven't seen this talk or, or read the article, you should. Um, and I couldn't, I, I, I wasn't sure who's, who, who's trademarking mechanism I should use here, so I just include them all. Right? Um, Multi-methods are a really, really interesting thing Clojure has to sort of, um, get, to sort of implement this open-closed idea, right? We can extend things with new, new def methods, right? Are multi-methods always open? No. They depend on what your dispatch function is, right? So this print dump, uh, these, these guys are all from you know, the actual closure source code. Um, class X, it's sort of an open idea, right? Like if you inject a new thing into there and it's a new class that closure core has never seen before, it's fine. You can just uh, implement print dump with um, whatever this new class is and it's fine. Now if you want to use a new is leaf, um, a, a new type to is leaf, you got a problem because there's a there's an instance of check and there's a there's a sequential check. If you want to add a new type that, that's not enumerated here, then you've got to go in and change that code. So how can we get around that? Um, we can't actually extend the dispatch function, right? It, it it exists, you know, it's it's written then and there, and it's it's done for, right? Well. That's true uh, for the existing, this existing dispatch function, but what if we wrote all of our dispatch functions uh, with another level of indirection in them? What if our dispatch functions were all multi-methods and they could, they could accept, um, accept uh, new def methods, right? So this is an ex uh, another level of indirection that we could have used here for collection tag. And we could, in you can imagine inserting here like maybe a, like a Java util list um, and returning a seek in that case as well. doesn't really solve the problem, but it's, it's one interesting idea if you want to really, really make your, your dispatch method um, sort of open, right? Now, the problem we have here is that dispatch functions aren't always necessarily like instance objects. It turns out that we could do this because sequential turns out to be like essentially another instance object, right? It's, it's just, you know, closure lang sequential, basically a type of check, and uh, We've got this ability, right? But it, it could be that you're, you, you need finer granularity, right? That's the whole interesting thing about multi-methods is that they allow you to do things other than switch on type, right? You can actually you know, have two different sort of ways of dispatching for um, two different kinds of maps, right? Like maybe if your map has a, a given key in it, you want to dispatch in one way, and if it doesn't, you want to dispatch another way, right? So it's, this is kind of like almost disingenuous to say, like, this is the solution to everything, right? It's not. It's just one way to think about making things more extensible. And it may be that you don't need that uh, flexibility, but if you do, this is, this is one way to think about it. So predicate dispatch, it, it would be a really awesome way um, if, if, if somebody can clone David Nolan and get him to, to you know, do everything at once. Um, he's, he's working on some really interesting stuff. Um, and if you haven't seen his closure conch talk, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, But the idea is that that would be a way to extend uh, the dispatch function um, to, to add additional cases, additional sort of pattern matching sort of ideas. 
more generalized pattern matching. So when you're thinking about multi-methods, one thing you might want to think about is dispatch functions, making those guys extensible themselves. So I'm going to make again a claim that this is a problem because uh, I say the word's too many, but if, if you've got a unit of your code that's doing too many things, why is that hard, right? Why is that a problem? It's hard to reason about, right, is, is my big thing, right? It may, may make things hard to change as well um, because this program unit could have, like, a lot of clients. A lot of people could be using it. They're all going to want to use it in slightly different ways. You're going to have to have changes inside your program unit to accommodate those different clients. They may conflict at some point, right? And this can be a, a, a cause for pain, and that's that's kind of why the single uh, responsibility principle says to sort of limit these things, right? Reuse is going to be impeded. So if we have a single reason to change, then there's, you know, one reason to change. Things are easier to keep in our heads, um, and, and things are easier to use in general, I think. Um, and, and this is kind of like the core of, uh, of what modularity is all about, right? When we say modularity, what I, I think a lot of times we mean is that we want to we take one concern and move it in this one place, take another concern and move it to another place, right? You can think about it in sort of the same way as, as OO people think about single responsibility. It's a really, really, really similar concept. In OO, generally we're thinking about the class level, right? So you can imagine in Clojure we're, we're going to be thinking about protocols, types, records. We can also, of course, think about it at the function level, right? We don't want one function to be doing seven things, right? And Clojure is sort of like uh, famous for, you know, we, we, we don't like side effects, right? We don't want to be opening a do block and doing seven side effects and then returning something. You know, there are cases where we need to do that, obviously, um, but if we can avoid it, that'd be great. So just as a quick example, this is a, a solution to Project Euler, right? We, we're going to find the sum of all the multiples of three or five below a thousand. Right, and it's just kind of, kind of a three-line solution, really small, really simple, but you can imagine this thing being like an, a solution to actual business problem that's much larger and conflates all kinds of other concerns. So what if we split it up like this? What if we split out the ideas of, divide, of divisibility um, from the idea of you know, solving this actual concrete problem, right? We can take many other steps here, and it's, it's kind of not always clear like how, ma how far we need to go with this, how far we need to separate things out. Um, but I, I think the idea of divisibility is definitely like a reusable thing, right? We're talking closure about composable abstractions. This divisibility thing is uh, it's, it's definitely something we could use elsewhere, right, for solving project other problems. And then we can just use that guy down here, right? Divides any. This guy's kind of, you know, sketchy. Is he can be used elsewhere, maybe? But if we give a name on him, if, if we give him a name, uh, when we're looking at solve Euler one, we can think about fewer things, right? And I think that's, to me, the name of the game. If, if I've got a function that is thinking about a few things, it's easier to, to think about what's going on than it is if I have a function that's doing many things. And there's certainly like an element of subjectivity here, right? Like, what what is a thing, right? What what is a reason to change? It kind of depends on you know who the clients of your function are. It depends on like how big of a level of granularity you're thinking about, right? Am I the one thing that I'm doing is serving up a website that sells coupons, right? That that's a that's a big abstraction, right? Um, so it, it it it's it's an interesting um, problem to think about. From what, le from what perspective are you, uh, are you approaching this single responsibility idea, right? And it may be that throughout your system you have one big responsibility that's huge, and then further down you have uh, sort of lower level protocols that, that have, you know, smaller responsibilities. But at each level you kind of, um, I think it's a good idea to think about having, having one. Having a function do one thing, having a namespace basically responsible for one idea, having a, a protocol responsible for basically one thing. So in conclusion, um, Dylos, it's actually you know, not, not really any different than solid, right? There are, there are obvious parallels, right, with the protocols, records. Those are sort of OO concepts that Clojure does, I think, much better than a Java or even a Ruby. Um, 
And there's also things that are almost you know, totally new. Def, def multi, you know, multi methods are really cool stuff. Um, I, think, I, I think the really interesting one to me, though, is, is the idea of functions as abstractions. Um, But I think we can learn other stuff from OO. There's, this is a really interesting book by Robert Martin. Um, if you're interested in, in learning more about Solid and the sort of the ideas that are trying to solve, this is interesting. I mean, there's, there's a lot of C++ code in here, so you kind of have to struggle through that. Um, but it's interesting stuff. Um, and, and the thing I, I, I would like sort of um, urge you to do is to not reinvent the wheel, right? Th there are certainly ideas that we have that are that are new in Clojure, right? Like STM stuff is awesome. The idea of um, functional programming is, is totally separate from, an, from OO, right? There's, there's like things that are very different. But there are also great ideas, right, from the past that we were using in Clojure, right? Like databases have been around a while, Clojure's using them. Um, these OO ideas have been around for a while. Uh, Clojure has them implemented very well. Um, and I, I think w we should be careful not to like dismiss out of hand the ideas from things like OO um, or, you know, imperative programming, you know, the Linux kernel, stuff like that. There's some really interesting ideas that I think we can learn from from all sorts of paradigms. Um, and, and the other thing would be to, you know, while you're doing that, don't go to extremes and, and, and say, okay, there's this principle and therefore I'm just going to follow it blindly, right? Think about why things are hard, what your particular use case is. It may be that you don't actually expect your program to ever change. Maybe that, like, you're going to write this program, it's going to take 15 minutes and you're going to throw it away. You know, building all these le levels of abstraction may be overkill, right? You may just not want to do it. So think about, are these real problems that could occur to you? Um, and well, what, what problems are we actually trying to solve when we decide to, to make an abstraction or to consume one? And also to think about what else we can learn, right? Um, these are ideas from OO. Um, the logic stuff is really interesting. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are sort of like intrigued by all the, all the, all the core logic stuff and the pattern matching and stuff. Um, but there's a lot of interesting stuff out there, and I, I, would, I would encourage you to, to take a look at, at other paradigms as well. That's all I got. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting question. The question is kind of uh, about, about you know, what, if it, you tell me if I'm, I'm misstating or anything, but the, it, about how we can actually apply these on a daily basis, what, what we can do as far as like releasing projects and stuff like that, and, and how, to, how to apply these principles. Uh, maybe even like just down to the like, packaging level, like, you know, how you yeah, absolutely. And there's actually like a bunch of package principles that are sort of like you know on a macro scale of, of these, and the, they're in the book I mentioned. But um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I mean, first of all, I, I, I think I, I tend to see like a sort of danger if you release things too fast, right? You don't know what they're going to look like, and it means you've committed to an abstraction that may not actually be right, right? Like I, I've certainly written code that um, I've put out in open source and thank God nobody used it because I like just ripped it apart very soon after. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a difficult line to walk. It, creating an abstraction is not easy, right? Like um, you have to be sure that it's, it's going to be good. I, I mean, I, I, there's this book, Effective Java by Josh Bloke. I think this is, he says his last name, but, um, and he, he talks about the idea of, you know, before you actually release a, a library, you, you want to actually get people to implement it, you know, twice or more, right? Like three times before you, before you actually know that, that abstraction's right. You implement it one time, and it's kind of like, yeah, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Um, so that's one idea to think about, is, is when you release an abstraction using it multiple times. I, I definitely think the idea of, you know, small libraries is, is cool. Um, but yeah, you, you can't get yourself into into like sort of an overly complex solution. Um. It just seems like you know if you have the possibility to leak things and kind of design things in a way that's then really hard to refactor later. Like you might be much more inclined to do that. But if you just can't, simply can't. Like if you kind of put up these safeguards, like you might, you know, not enough enough analogous to like you know, unit testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Unit testing is an interesting thing because, like, I, I, earlier you mentioned I, I don't want to like hash over like details, but you, you you mentioned something about like unit testing being able to help you find edge cases and stuff. And I think that's definitely true, but I mean it, it it takes. I mean, it's not the unit tests that are that are helping you do that. Unit tests are like encoding them, encoding your expectations into the into you know your test suite. The think the thinking is is sort of like a a thing that you do while you're unit testing, right? Like. The tests themselves don't find the edge cases, right? You find the edge cases and you write tests about them. But uh, sure. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Cool. I'd, I'd love to talk more about like you, you guys' opinions about this stuff and like what what you think is is right and wrong. I love being wrong because it means I learned something, right? Like so. Um, yeah, love to talk more about about this with you guys later. Thanks.